reality. <laughs> No. You don't have anything like that? I didn't hear it. Maybe I didn't want to hear it. Actually, you know, because I'm here, um, first I want to give you a little plug on Texas A&M, uh, because we actually also, hey, we have a meteorology program too, uh, graduate and undergraduate program. Uh, and this is, uh, I don't know, I grabbed these from my, uh, these are kind of sliced up slides for my department head. We actually have, this is our building where most of, we have a small college, kind of like here, you know, here's a small college, right, with meteorology and geography and somebody else, mm -hmm. geology, maybe, something like that. <laughs> we're similar, except we have oceanography. We, we're sort of near an ocean, you know. Oceanography <laughs> is very similar to atmospheric science. They have salt, we have clouds. Otherwise, they're pretty similar. I, you know, fluid, it's all about fluid dynamics. Um, so anyway, we're also a small college there. Um, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have ocean, we have paleo people, people that go drill the ocean cores down for back hundreds of thousands of years. That's cool, paleo climate, paleo tempestology, that means ancient hurricane, <coughs> something like that. I don't know, it's cool. Um, we have 22 faculty, we're, not, we're almost this large as actually the, the OU department here. We have 60 grad students, we have about 150 undergrads, I don't know how many are here. About them, yeah. So it's it's, it's yeah. a pretty comparable size program, funding from a lot of sources. Okay, now I'm just gonna flip through the things we do, and I grab these pictures of it. We kind of fun with it. Uh, we we do weather forecasting, um, numerical weather prediction, data simulation, synoptic meteorology, severe weather. These are some. Of the, there are people there. I, I didn't just grab these random ones off the web. That would have been funny. I should have just grabbed your guys' pictures. <laughs> that would have been really funny. Um, I guess wait, Diane. I I I. I don't know who group these. Dynamical meteorology and climate dynamics. I'm there. I'm a tropical meteorology and radar, I'm a radar person too. Um, but there's a lot of climate. We have a we've kind of really uh, hired a lot lately in climate and geophysical fluid dynamics. So but I, that's, this is definitely a huge strength of ours. And we also have a really strong physical component. Satellite people. Uh, someone even drives a ro the guy on the far left drives the ro Mars rovers and things. These are planetary science. Just like how many he goes on Mars time when he's in the field. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know we have a number of satellite lightning. We have a lightning specialist at Corville there. We actually also I know it's crazy and you guys don't have to do a lot. So we have four atmospheric chemists, lab chemists, uh, which is sort of interesting. I right? chemistry. Think about air pollution and health. Think about um, aerosols and climate. So that's it's sort of a, a strength of ours. If you have any interest in inkling in, in chemistry, come you need to come to our department if you're thinking about grad school. Or you know, just just saying. So that I'm, I'm, giving, I'm throwing that out there. Your friends that are interested in grad school, say hey, Texas A&M. They have a lot of people doing cool things there. I think I, I you know I think I got all the pictures. Okay, so now I'm going to talk. Uh, let's see. Did I start again? Yeah. Uh, Dynamo. Okay, I know it's tropical. But let's let's get excited a little bit. Oh, MJ, who has heard of the Madden Julian oscillation? Oh, awesome, fantastic! It's the new ENSO. No one studies ENSO anymore. Really, you go to tropical conferences. ENSO. Oh, MJ, it's so it is really the coolest thing. What is ENSO? This is this picture. It's sort of looping through. For those of you who don't know what it is, or sort of just heard the name and are wait, raising your hand to make me happy, how does this look like? I don't know. What do you guys see? What's it doing? This is precipitation, December, January, February. It's kind of a, what's it doing? So the, focus on the anomaly. So the, 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 up, the top is how the total rainfall is changing across the tropics. So you have a lot of rain in the maritime continent, the Indian Ocean, the ITCZ. So hopefully you're familiar with that. Look at the anomaly. What's the anomaly doing? Okay. Yeah, it's alternate. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's, it's propagating. Which direction is it propagating? Eastward. How fast? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's going to be more like three to five meters per second, but come on, really. Um, yeah, so it's propagating eastward. Is that fast or slow? Is that, how fast is that? Well, it's you know it's actually it's it's slow from like a yeah it, it depends what scale you're talking about. Kelvin waves go three times as fast. Um, it's going kind of slow, but it takes how you know how long you know it takes you know it's a thirty to sixty day oscillation, so it takes a while to get across the tropics. 
Um, but you see, most of the signal and precipitation is in the wet, in the, is in the Indian Ocean and, and West Pacific. So why do we care? So okay, so you guys just got this. So it's a 30 to 60 day oscillation, eastward propagating with the. How did you did you like did you look at my slide ahead of time? You just know that. I know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it's actually most of, it was first Madden and Julian, you know, discovered it in the 70s in zonal winds from soundings. But, uh, you know, you're, it also, it's accompanied by this strong deep convection that I just showed that loop of in precipitation. It's important. Why do we care? Well, it impacts weather. For instance, west coast flooding, right? So when, uh, so I'm, I'm showing the signal here. So, the, and this is the MGO property. Uh, this is about every week. It's propagating downward here um, and, and eastward. Uh, and you can see that here, as, as the MJO makes its way eastward, it pushes a ridge. Um, it also pushes the ridge uh, east, and then it has a direct moisture source into the west coast that can cause flooding. It can cause, it can enhance tropical cyclogenesis. Um, and so this is, this is showing anywhere where there's green. It, it means there's enhanced uh, potential uh, uh, vorticity at upper levels that that's enhancing, and those little circles or tropical cyclones that have formed as you move eastward. So that's not only, that's across the Pacific, but also into the Atlantic, where you guys might care a little bit more, right? So this is the westerly phase, so when the MJO um, is active, it's coming here, you have these westerly anomalies, you have a lot more <coughs> hurricane or tropical cyclone activity in the Caribbean um, and Gulf, as opposed to not. So that, so okay, we want to pay attention to that too, right? Flooding. Tropical cyclones. That's, that's not exciting. I know it's not severe. The one of the, there's a grad student I met at lunch. He's studying. No, it's Enso and Enso and tornadoes. Somebody's must have done MJO and tornadoes. There's a correlation. I don't know if you haven't do it as a, like a class project. Pick a capstone. I don't know. <laughs> I want to say someone might have done that. Or it's recently out. They try to correlate MJO activity with tornado activity. Um, it's all predictability in general. Uh, I just left the observations, uh, forget about the diagram, just look at the, the pattern itself. So you see a lot of like, this, this, this right here is the MJO, this little dot right here, I tried to circle it. And you see these are different models and they get it to varying degrees, some get it well, some get it, don't, don't get it at all. So basically the MJO is hard to model. Um, and, and, that, and, that, and that's it, the worst the prediction between, I mean the worst predictions or correlations we have for predictions is in phase two which is when the MJO initiates in the Indian Ocean. This is this phase, just don't worry about the phases. We're just, just run with me on this. But if you know enough, you guys know about the MJO, if you know its speed, you know about the Wheeler and Hendon phases. So the whole point is it's, um, it's, it's, it's important to predictability and to severe weather events, um, at least in um, not severe in your world, but maybe severe in my world. But we really don't know why it starts. We don't, we still don't know why the MJO happens, and so we did this, a field experiment called, well, it was Dynamo, but it was also Cindy, Amy. You know, it's just lots of acronyms. I'll call it Dynamo from here on out, but it's a multi, it's an international, 11 countries were involved. A lot of us went to the Indian Ocean in 2011 and 2012, and these were the three main hypotheses. The first, the first two are the ones I want you to, to focus on. One is here's the, the MJO, it's the convection, as the convection creates moisture in the environment, so the MJO likes big moist atmosphere. So saying, well, the convection promotes a big moist atmosphere, and that's why the MJO um, forms. Or um, that different cloud types. So you have to pay attention. You have shallow clouds and the cumulus congestus or deep clouds, and and that that's actually important to the MJO initiation. The upper air ocean thing, I don't think it was actually that important. We just wanted NOAA money for ships and planes. <laughs> And then, you know, and actually, I don't think the ocean aquifers, they were like, yeah, we'll go out there because it's a very unobserved ocean basin. It gave them a good reason. I don't know. I mean, there's a little bit. They care a little bit. It's not, I don't, it's not one of the main theories. And so is a very ocean coupled process. MJO? Yeah. Okay, so let's focus on clouds and moisture, okay? Clouds and moisture. Okay, so now what, what's exciting about this? So now we get exciting deployment, field deployments in the tropics. Who here has been in the field? Field. <laughs> you're, you're a problem. <laughs> Do I, can I like send one person down at least? Go for it. <laughs> Do I have that for obvious? <laughs> okay. This is all. This is like the observational arsenal we we, we threw at this problem. Um, so Indian Ocean, like I said, that's where it kind of likes to. So we had uh, oh the French came in with the Falcon. 
Um, as, well, this is in progress. Focus smarter. Who's sad and smarter? Touch smarter. Oh, more of you, good. Yeah. <laughs> smarter. I sent that to the Maldives. Epic. I'll talk a little more about that. Um, uh, let's see. The DOE, this is the mobile facility from DOE. NOAA P3 was there. There's a couple ships. So the Rebel was there. The Japanese Mirai was there. So the NOAA P3 was located at Diego. You see a lot of the radars were here at Adu Atoll. So we had a lot of ships out there, right? There's, there's a lot of little islands, but you know, when you want to spread out, there's a lot of big ocean. Like I said, it was um, October 2011, supposedly to March 2012. I'll tell you why that might not have necessarily been the case. Okay, so this huge field of years of planning, years of planning, and part of that planning, make it exciting, you think it's not exciting in the tropics, pirates. So we were actually, in the planning process, we had to do things like worry about, not only about, oh, what instruments are going where, what's going to get the best science, but are we going to get there safely, and then are our instruments going to be there when we leave? So the pirates, so every briefing we'd have the pirates, the pirates kept on moving, uh, eastward, like the MJO, uh, and we were kind of like, do not go further than the Maldives because then insurance prices go up incredibly. You know, the ship people, especially the buoy people, you know, the people on the islands were like, okay, the pirates are not going to bother us on the islands, but all the ships were like, this is a, this is an issue. So th this is this is actually pirate, you know, planning a field project. Sometimes you have to deal with things like pirates. It's not just dummy duck out <laughs> there. Okay, so the reality, so Adu Atoll, it's, the, it's the, the farthest south atoll in the Maldives. So just to get to the Maldives, like if I had a globe, like Oklahoma would be here, the Maldives would be here. Epic, you know, 36, 48 hour trips, um, you know, which way, you can fly either way, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's all the same. It took a long time to get there, it took many months for the equipment to get there. We, I shipped Smartar um, on, a, on a kind of put up. I didn't have a crate, it doesn't have a crate, right? So you had to put it on this lift thing and then it'd be craned up onto ships and off of ships and uh, yeah, I tracked that for a couple months. S pole was nearby, so Smart Air was up on Heat the Deuce, S pole was nearby, so Smart Air is, S, is C band, S pole is S band, that has a little K A band, this little guy here, it's a K A band. Um, the Falcon had a cloud radar on it, a K A band cloud radar, um, and then there's vertically pointing a K A band here at the AMF site, so here at the uh, down at uh, Gann Island. So the whole point of having all those different wavelengths, do you guys know what I'm talking when I say S-band? How many centimeters? C-band. Five. K-A-band. One? <laughs> yeah, two, well, yeah, yeah, one. K-U would be two. There we go. Someone's taking a radar. Um, don't you all have to take a radar here? Isn't that required? <laughs> You're kidding. I also work with the smart artists, if that makes you feel Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. So but the whole point, why do we care? Why do we need all this wavelengths? Why do we argue to all these program managers to spend millions of dollars on this project? Besides, oh, we're going to help you increase predictability of the MJO and understand what happens and all that. Is this, because you get the full spectrum of tropical convection. Right? So the, the millimeter wavelengths, so, so the K, yeah, KA. Yeah, let's, let's, let's call that the millimeter. 10, yeah, one, one centimeter, 10 millimeter, whatever. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the smaller wavelengths were good for the non-precipitating clouds. Um, then to get into the centimeter wavelengths are really good for the precipitating or in deeper air motions and things like that. And the millimeter wavelength, again, good for ample cloud structure and cirrus and things like that. And dual wavelength, you could do things like humidity retrievals. So we wanted to see the full convective spectrum to understand, uh, the, 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 in terms of the MJO, what's most important. And what might that look like? These were some of the observations we took. So, um, so the KA band is vertically pointing, so it gets really good at seeing uh, all the very really small, the alto, the alto cumulus, the cirrus, that attenuate. The problem is that attenuates in deep convection. Uh, so over here, this is smart R reflectivity. Um, don't you're not as sensitive as the, the shorter wavelengths, but you certainly still see. Um, a lot of the deep convection without much attenuation. The nice thing about vertical, and we did have different scanning strategies. So we had vertically pointing radars, so you can get vertical motions and microphysical retrievals. But of course, then we want to look around us. And the scanning motions give you the full volume, but also uh, there's a lot of shear. We actually saw a lot of shear during Dynamo we weren't expecting. So you can see that from the Doppler velocities from SmartR. S pole was polymetric, so SmartR is not, but S pole is polymetric, dual pole. So you can get hydrometer identifications. Where's the grapple? Where's the snow? You know, that's, that's all very interesting. 
So these are all these, these again, retrievals and, to, and, and tools and variables that we were using to look at the, the cloud spectrum. Okay, now I'll have some fun pictures. These were sort of working conditions. Um, this is uh, some people in the smart our cab. This is us, you know, the fuel truck coming and on our little spit to fuel us up. Oh, this is um, this is S pole, but I think the KA band, broke, the transmitter broke, so I had to crane it off and put it back on. And this, there's a lot of containers. S pole is nice because actually containers to sit in. It's not just a few of you like crum crumpled up into the smart our van. Um, S pole also had a bathroom. That was nice. Uh, so we hung out there a lot more. <laughs> there you can see it about. Bathroom. So you know, we have the, there's those of us hanging out. Um, living conditions. So I was the, I was actually there for three months. A lot of us were there for. There's a number of us there for many months. It was a, it's an MGO. Remember remember how long that is? Thirty to sixty days. So if you want to measure one, you should go for at least two months. I know. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so a lot of people lived in Equator Village, which was on Gann Island, and it's it's um it's sort of the Maldives. Do you guys, do you guys know about the Maldives? It's this like beautiful tropical paradise, little private islands. Tom Cruise, I think, owns his own island there. I mean, it's very expensive resorts, and then there's Gann Island, which was a mil it was a, it was a, it was a British uh, air force base. And uh, so they turn all the barracks and things into like the Holiday Inn of the Maldives. So all those cheap <laughs> Russians would show up and, and stay there. And so we had, and basically everyone stayed there. Although you can, and then this is in, this is in front of the Equator Village. They actually had nice beaches. This is my house. So I actually got a house because I I was up on Heath the I brought my daughter and my mother-in-law. My grad students lived with me. Um, I wanted a house. I was bringing my family. I was pregnant with my second daughter. I was like, I'm just going. I'm going for three months. My daughter enrolled my daughter in preschool there. Um, and uh, there was a park nearby. I just wanted to be, you know, I wanted a house, and I wanted to be in the community. And you can see us at the park. This is Maxine, my daughter. And then with the, we just made lots of friends there. We'd hang out. They're, they're Muslim there. Uh, and just really nice, friendly people. And because of, the, because of the English Air Force Base, a lot of them spoke better English than a lot of other people on different islands. So it was nice. I'm just saying, be open-minded in your field work, right? Be open-minded. It's, 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 it can be really, really great. Okay, weather conditions. The type of uh, the weather conditions. We, this is a nice, beautiful cloud. You know, a nice cumulonimbus cloud that uh, shearing off pretty strong. I mean, that strong shear I was talking about. We had weekly briefly is at the the GAN at the Equator Village uh, Resort, and this is the satellite. So now talking about the MJO, the MJO is a modulation of weather. Okay, so this is the, you know, here's India here, where we are in the Maldives. You can see here an inactive MGO period, there's still convection around, but in the active period, there's just more of it. So there's, it's, not, it's not stopping convection when the, when the MGO is not happening, it's just modulating it. Um, so what, were the, what did we actually get? So this is the, this is the Wheeler and Hendon, and, uh, di like, well, I don't know, some weird diagram that everyone it loves, it's, it's good. But what it tells you, it's, um, it tells you where the MJO is, what phase it is, and how strong it is. So here in October, we started here on the second. You can see we were in phase six, so the MJO was far away from us, but it rapidly came in, and we had a nice strong MJO right away. We were like, score. <laughs> October, one MJO, nice. Then, uh, then, it, then you can tell it weakened, um, started meandering in the week in the kind of no land zone of mjo -ness. And then in November, it kind of popped out of that, and bam. November, MJO, 30 days later, we were so psyched. Or 35 days later, or whatever. We're like, we've already got two MJOs in two months, and they were really nice. And then, something weird happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then in December, because the MJO, remember, phase two, it's phase two and three, it's when it's active in the Indian Ocean. Phase one, it's when it's sort of, phase one through three, this is sort of Indian Ocean. Then, then the MJO just decided to sort of meander this index, action. at least this index, decided to just, do, 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 do. I'm going to go this way, go this way, oh, I'm going this way. Okay, it's not supposed to do that. But I'll show you, we actually got convection during this period that sort of looked like MJO convection, but we're like, what is this? So there's a, still a debate in the community what this was, but this index does not call it an MJO. And then, okay, January was super, no, nah, I was boring, it's strong. We were like, oh boy, boy, we're going, we're building up to the next MJO, it's coming, the third one in six months, we're going to be so psyched, because everyone else left in January except SmartR and the mobile facility from DOE. We're like, we are there, SmartR is there, we're going because we're, we're cheap and we can just run this thing with a couple of students. And uh, DOE it only needs a few techs to run their, their arm sites, their mobile facilities. Oop. Then the coup happened. 
Um, this is Nasheed. He, uh, there's actually a pres President Nasheed. He was forced to resign at gunpoint in early February. Um, there were riots in response. Um, there's actually a documentary about him, the island president that came around last year, a year or two ago. Um, he's the one, he's, he's the young, there had been this dict dictator guy for 30 years, and he was the first democratically elected president of the Maldives and, you know, that 30, you know, after 30 years, and then people just got unhappy. And some more conservative elements of the, the community decided to, the military decided to force him to resign. Because of this, we had to stop the field campaign. I had to evacuate my students. We had to, you know, secure a smart hour as best we can and leave it there until things calm down. I was so sad from so many perspectives. So again, uh, unexpected, Maldives, come on, you know, coups in the Maldives, who, who would have thought? Um, so again, another, another thing about field work, you never know what can happen, be prepared. Um, everything turned out okay, my, the, our, radar, our radar engineer went back about a month later, got smarter, and we shipped it back. Um, elections happened um, actually recently, so, um, and Nasheed came in second. So, so now things are seem to be more stable there, but. Anyway, sort of interesting, right? Okay, right now, and then I'll just, you know, not, I'm not going to spend a long time on this, but I'm going to talk now about the observations that we took with SmartR on Audio Atoll to kind of get at a little bit of the science that we have kind of, we're working on. It's still active, so it takes years. You, you get field campaign data. Some of you who raise your hands might be part of Vortex too. Who knows? I think maybe that's happened before your time. I mean, whatever, you, you know, it takes time. You gotta analyze the data, and then, oh, it's messy. You have to reprocess it, and you have to work with the modelers, and all this. So it takes time. Uh, for the for the kind of insights to come out, but now it's been about two years. Things are starting to come out. I have my own thoughts about what's important, at least from our data set. So again, this is where Smarter was. This was yeah me in front of Smarter and some of my other students. I had a lot of students helping me throughout this this time period. It was great. I had, from many different universities. Um, my you know it was it was great. So Smarter. So this is a surveillance scan on one of our big twenty third oh, November twenty third our Thanksgiving Day storm. So we had a really, this is a great, um, a great event, oops, I went back. But you can see here we have a cab blockage, and also we actually don't, aren't getting a lot of good return there. We had too much clutter from trees, um, which is more than we thought. We couldn't really raise ourselves very much, so we're really stuck to analysis in this 180 degree sector. Okay, so what I'm showing you is that the rain accumulation through that period, those, those three and a months and 10 days or whatever before you had to go turn off the radar. It still bumps me out. I hate thinking about it. This is this is hard for me, guys. <laughs> I hope you appreciate me when I do this emotional. Okay, so the MGO. Let's see. Uh, you know, just focus on the solid, the solid lines. Um, that's the total rain. So you can see, as the MGO is ramping up, we get a lot more rain. Then it bubbles down, but it's periodic here. What do you think? Every two days, bop, 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 bop. Every two days. Dies off, things die off, and then, oh, then we get up. Now we're starting to ramp up every like four to six days, and then we hit MJO2. So something, we've got different, we've got different inner scales here. We've got two day, we've got four to six day, we've got this 30 day MJO cycle. Then things die down, and then we get into this weird December thing. Okay. So people actually are calling this the third MJO. I still, I don't know, I'm on the fence. And things get really quiescent, which then was interesting because a lot of times it takes a while for the MJO to kick off. And so then we're like, oh, we're going to this really quiescent period, nothing's happening, we're going to, this huge MJO is on its way, and then the coup happens. <laughs> right here. So we're like, oh, we're building up, we're building up. Oh, okay. Anyway, so now <laughs> let's link this back. Let's go back to the theories. Let me go into the theories a little bit more about what MJO initiation. Um, let's see. So here, this is the idea. So you're in your suppressed phase, so you've got shallow convection. Then it starts building up, so you start getting your cumulus congestus. Um, and, the, and then you get into your deep convection, and then you're, this is in your developing MJO, and then you have your big MCSs and your mature phase, covering a really large area. Um, and then things die off, and roll out and die off, and then you go back into your suppressed phase. But this part, this part is really important. So you start out with shallow convection, and then somehow it has to organize on this huge scale of the MJO. Huge. Um, so how does it do that? So does the, do the clouds moisten the environment? So do they grow and then detrain and moisten the environment? That's one theory. So that's the, then that's this moisture source theory. You have a big, broad moisture area. Or does the heating associated with these clouds from condensation, um, uh, free, you know, uh, deposition? Well, let's, let's stick with condensation because we're talking more about the low-level clouds. Does that low-level heating then cause moisture convergence? 
so that the clouds create clouds through their heating, causing moisture convergence. So those are two theories um, how clouds can affect the MJO, or or does the or does the moisture just come from somewhere else and allow the clouds to grow? So are the clouds sort of an active passer, so a, a large scale horizontal advection from somewhere. Uh, is, is that it? Okay, so let's look at what uh, what what SmartR saw. So these are um, 10 dBZ equitops by MJO Fay. So it's sort of a time, it's a timeline. I keep on losing my cursor here. It's a timeline, so remember this one and two is the active time. But you can see, well, in MJO one, the convective echotops build, right? That's consistent with what I, that schematic I just showed. Um, it, kind of in a continuous evolution. Here it's a little more episodic because we're in that four to six day cycle, but we're still building in height. So that sounds good. Oh, this is consistent with our conceptual model, what satellites have seen. Um, what, what um, you know, GCM say it happens. Yeah, here's that December thing. Yeah, okay. So at least there's a growth, and maybe not continuous, but there seems to be growth from shallow to deep, consistent, but so it's happening. So let's link that back to um, things like the um, humidity. So we were doing eight songs per day, grueling sound ske song schedule um, from GAM. And again, this is, this, is, this is now day, this is the MJO, like the height of the MJO, and this is the days before that MJO. And you can see that moisture buildup. This is composited for all the MJOs we had. And do you see that nice moisture buildup? But which comes first? The, the clouds or the moisture? The chicken or the eggs? The cloud or the moisture? The chicken or the eggs? I don't know what you think. Do I have it written here? I do. I have it written. You could read the slide. Doesn't the convective rain seem to come before the mid tropospheric moistening? I don't know. What do you guys think? Oh, we do some lag correlations. Okay, convective rain leads it. <laughs> uh, we do this a little bit. Yeah, so you can see here, the convective rain is really popping off. And, you know, it's sort of, it's not, it's definitely popping off before this com comes through, this moistening. And then you get into your very, high, then the stratiform rain, this is when your stratiform rain starts really catching up. And you have your big MCSs here where your stratiform rain ex exceeds. You guys know convective stratiform rain, right? You have a name, you live and breathe that, right? Convective stratiform. I'm sorry, just so making assumptions based on the program you are coming from. Um, so, so either convection has helped providing that large scale moisture, um, or mid tropospheric moisture is not that important, not this important trigger based on just our in situ observations. The other thing is the heating. So I do this, I play this fun game. I'm sort of known for heat, making heating profiles out of a hat, pulling them out of my radar hat. Um, but what you do, okay, latent heating. So precipitation is the column integrated latent heating, right? You condense stuff and then it rains out. So what rains out is sort of the net, you know, it's the net heating and the, the happening in the atmosphere, but you have it at the surface. But you can distribute that in the vertical somehow. It's a little bit of magic. But I say, but you, I think you guys would go along with this. I'm sorry these lines are a little light. But this is shallow convection, um, and this, therefore you get shallow heating, right? Deeper convection, you're going to get deeper heating through the troposphere. Stratiform. Here you've got heating aloft, and then there's a zero degree Celsius level and then cooling below where you have evaporation in your mesoscale downdraft. These are basic, so if you use that and you apply that to the radar data, because we know if it's convective or stratiform, we know its heights, we know how much it's raining, we can get um, an estimate of the, late, of the heating associated with these things. And this is the total heating, and we don't see, there's not much of a tilt, you know, so I'm, I'm looking for this tilt really shallow to deep, but really the shallow convection is not doing a lot in this suppressed phase. And then it's really just the deep convection and the here and the stratiform that's, that's really kicking off and causing, is making the major heating signal. So the point here is that, that that tilt, that shallow to deep transition in clouds is not really, we don't see that in heating. The shallow heating is important. I, I, in my talk earlier today, I showed in detail why. I think the shallow heating is still important, but I don't think that tilt, the heating from that, the clouds, is that way. So I think it's going to have to be the moistening. Like if the clouds play a role, like it's going to be through the moistening and not through not through the heating, at least in a tilt perspective. But low level heating is good, bubbling, you're mixing out the, you know, more, the more moist ocean, getting that, you know, either causing moisture convergence or you're getting, you know, evaporating that um, into the air and making more seeding things. Okay, so I think that's about the right timing. Uh, it's five after, for three after. That's fine. Okay. Um, the MJO is, um, I, I hope I stress that, it's a keystone in the seamless weather to climate prediction. It's important, right? We should understand it. We should be able to predict it. Um, it can help us push, you know, predictable bar predictability barriers like the two-week, you know, who trusts the forecast past two weeks? 
well, if the MJO is coming by, maybe you can, actually. So, uh, and that's why, like I said, millions of dollars were spent from around the world to do this, to look at this. Smart Air observed two and a half unique MJO events in the Indian Ocean um, during this huge campaign, Dynamo Cindy Amy. Um, and it's not clear if mid-trip atmospheric moisture or shallow convective heating are really essential <laughs> to MJO initiation, which were two of the theories going in, that's why you go in. At least from our data set, again, it's a small, admittedly small data set, a couple of MJOs, but it makes us doubt the, you know, those aspects of the theories with in situ data. So I think that's it. Okay? Question. Yeah? There's a couple of pictures of the spar being like on the edge of the water, like two feet above. How do you prevent like waves from like. Oh, excellent question. Uh, we work on the lagoon side of the atoll. No, and please ask me anything. You guys ask me about grad school or research or the Maldives, like how the food was. I don't care, you know, the scuba diving was really good. No, the snorkeling was good. I was pregnant. I couldn't scoop it up. But anyway, it's great, you know. <laughs> no, but, but I want to show you. So yeah, so this, do you notice? So here's Oceanside. We're on the lagoon. Oh, uh, okay. So we were protected. We were in the, so I might show you go back and we have a bigger picture. Like here? Yeah, back farther. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 So it's, we're in the lagoon. Okay. And it's funny because it, and it was a popular fishing spit there, and so we had to like block it off and put radiation signs. We had guards. We had to pay for guards twenty four hours. We built this little thing, and you know we had to wait. And the sh boats would like stop and anchor off because we're like, no, go away. You know, like radiation, bad. And so that was like one of the other things we had to do besides monitor the radar. It was like, you know, radiation. But the waves, um, we were, oh, and a swim spot. So actually our blockage was down the road. So we put the cab that way because it was a popular swim spot. And we can't stop people from swimming there, right? So um, it was, yeah, the lagoon side. But good question, because we're like, yeah. It, oh, and it eroded. Oh, and it, yeah, the road to get there eroded. So we had to, like, get it fixed before we left. Um, yeah. Yeah. You didn't have any, like, storm surge or anything, like, strong thunderstorms and no? Okay. The lagoon really protected us. And the convection, you know, it's, um, you no, know, on the ocean side, big waves. No, you know, definitely. That's why a lot of people swam on the lagoon side, because the ocean, the ocean, there's a lot of trash on the ocean side. I mean, a lot of trash just gets thrown in the ocean, and then it comes back onto the, the beach. And so, um, you know, the lagoon was much nicer. No, and, you know, we have, we had, that's an interesting question. We had cold pools, like, and we actually observed some nice cold pools, but they're not nearly as strong as some of the ones that people have seen in other locations. So, um, there's something about even in Togo Core, like other, it just seemed like our colder pools were a little weaker, and you know, tropical convection is not as strong as what you have here. So we we get 10 meters per second is incredibly strong for updrafts for for the tropics, whereas here you get 30, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah. What would have happened if you had like a tropical storm hurricane? So conveniently, we were on the equator. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So, but that's an army base there, so or air force base or navy base or whatever it is. But uh, yeah, I don't know what they do. <laughs> we were on the quick. Um, the tsunami from a couple years before had impacted the northern islands. So some islands, like whole resorts, were you know wiped out, and so uh, people <laughs> lost their jobs and, and lots of maybe not. Maybe it wasn't as bad in the Maldives as other places, but the tsunami. I feel bad. My grad students were like, "We're going where?" Because you know the, the pirates were up, and the tsunami were like tsunami likelihoods in the mornings. I'm like, "It'll be okay." It'll be and then the coup happened. I'm like, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Were there any clear distinctions or differences between the patterns that led to the strong MJO and the random December mess? Were there any distinctions that were able to be picked yeah, out? Yeah, no, that's an interesting. Question: Because there's this idea that the MJO doesn't necessarily initiate on its own in the Indian Ocean, and that it just goes round and round, and you can see the signal as it propagates around and the graphic and stuff. And so, but there's some that's then there's some people that say, well, some initiate in place and some around and around. And so we think those ones that go fast are from something, you know, something's going around and round or okay. extra tropical. You know, we've been, we've been arguing so much what the heck that December one is. I don't think people have looked at the precursors for that. I just didn't know if there was any sort of clear. Synoptic no. pattern or no, but that's like what I'm that, saying. So sometimes, sometimes there's arguments the extra tropics mm -hmm. can help trigger the MJO or this, yeah. you know, like I said, the propagator or some Kelvin wave that keeps on going around. Or, 
But but there's enough. There's at least forty percent of them. One of the recent studies I saw. There's at least forty percent of NGOs that like just form in place. Okay. And the trigger, the extra tropical intrusions aren't going to may they trigger the MDO, but you still need the right conditions mm -hmm. to get to that. It's an interesting question. I think we were still in that sort of analysis period, and a lot of people have been focusing on the first and second MDO because they're so clean and mm -hmm. nice and well-observed. So the December one still, I think people are like, yeah, no, it's a good question at the precursor, because it could have been different precursors. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm wondering if you to study this, um, like another big scale research project, at least in a different location, and maybe collect some more data. For the MJO? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, we're writing a proposal for the year of the maritime continent. Yeah, the year of the maritime continent. So to study the MJO propagation over the maritime continent, sending um, arm site, DO, the, the, the DOE site, the SCOL, to Indonesia. Okay. Uh, that's 2017-2018, so that planning is starting now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. Is it a matter that it's not <clears throat> efficient or something or to set up a more permanent establishment, you know, to be able to study it for longer periods of time rather than these three to six months span. Yeah, no, it, if you can argue that enough, like DOE is willing to set up permanent sites, so they have, DOE has permanent sites in Darwin and, and Papua New Guinea, but they just, you know, it's a lot of money, and it's like... The, well, but I mean, if you're putting millions of dollars to send, you know, the smart are out there, and it just seems yeah. like you could build a little shack and put a right, right on top of it. <laughs> and if you know, who's going to go and sit with that radar? Or when it's broken, you know, what do you um, <laughs> I mean, it's essentially the same as like the ethanol, but. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that, that's, that was like a one and a half, $1.2 million deployment just for ethanol. <laughs> so to have, to have the high quality data. You know, they had engineers on site, they had systems people on site. Smarter, I mean, I was like, you're the cheap little, like, cousins or whatever. We're just like, uh, you know, we're, you know, we're just running it on, on shoestring budget, and I spent, like, 400000 on my deployment, I think. I mean, so you might that. not get, obviously, the high-quality data, but it seems like some data would be better than no data. Yeah, so um, this, is, this would be a good precursor to that, say, look, we've studied this, but we still need more. Yeah, we need more MDOs. And then you could argue it to DOE. You could say, could you send out one of your mobile facilities for a year or two years? And then build off of that. And then you, but then you have to get the locals to like, be like, OK, can we put their, but you want a tower, right? Because we, we all had blockage. So we were like, so you'd have to build a tower, and that's expensive. And maintaining it is quite, I mean, to just get there, you know, something goes wrong. You know, and then it'll be down for a long time. So it, yes, it can be done, and you could argue it, but you have to be smart about it and, and make sure it's really valuable for that amount of money. It's not that cheap. It still won't be that cheap. Well, yeah, but, but you're right. But we did we did millions on this intensive campaign. Um, uh, you could, you guys, you could make that argument, especially if you continue making MJO this important thing. Yeah. Yeah. So get yeah. <laughs> Other questions? I have one. Yeah. Um, Smartar is sitting on sand. How did it stay level? No, it didn't. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there were it uh, the front left tire sank. Um, in the very beginning, and it's subtle, so it's sunk 0. 0.7 degrees. So, uh, Did you use the outriggers at all? No, we the took lights? them off before shift. Oh. <laughs> uh, to get things on and off the ship, we took them off, so we did not have the outriggers. Um, and it's coral sand, so I mean, it's just shifts, um, so it did sink. Uh, we, uh, we adjusted for that, we figured that out during the deployment and fi fixed it right when we got back in terms of our. Um, our processing. Another thing, and Mike, did Mike, I hope Mike told you guys about this. So we found out yet again that there was another tilt that we didn't know that the dish was down by point, point, 1.5 degrees. Um, and, and that happened, I think, when um, it was repaired um, right before the second season of Vortex 2. So there was the dish was taken off and put back on, slight offset. You're not going to notice it. That's 